Hey everybody, I think we're kind of having an emergency meeting about the, the senior project. Um, I think with this video, you'll be able to figure out uh, what to do for the proposal tomorrow. Basically, we've got two groups. I think I have the QF1, uh, QFIC2 doing the half micron and the QFIC um, group one doing the 0.18 micron. So that's, um, you know, one major difference is that of, of the different uh, technologies. The half micron could be more for automotive and the 0.18 could be more for, you know, ultimate low power. Now, um, there could be some confusion as to to what it is that we're trying to do here. All right, let's see if I can go through this as easily as possible. So I've uploaded, uh, if we just go back here, I have uploaded a lot of documents. Um, the LT Spice files, it's all in a zip file. So if you need some preliminary results, open it and run it. I have a BJT based neuron. I have all these other applications. Uh, using the quiffs for analog to digital conversion and then uh, some other things that I'll go through right now. So someone might say what you know you you did do a half micron um, QIF before and we did but only one worked so it's not very reliable and so we need to make a reliable neuron that works on every single chip. I think I know what the problem was is that we were exceeding the voltage rating, but I can't guarantee, I don't really know that that's the problem. That's just after years of trying to figure out what happened, that's what's going on. So in that, um, so right here is, even though it was done in cadence, you might not have access to that right now. Um, this is an LT spice. Version of it. Here's this MOSFET for the half micron. You can zoom in. Those are the power supplies. We have an inverting summing block. Hysteretic reset non-inverting integrator and then the multiplier right so that's those are all the parts that have to be done now it's true maybe um, we should not have used plus or minus five volts um, but really plus or minus two and a half volts and that's why everything didn't work my other suspicion is in the analog multiplier and if we look at what's going on, a lot of the the a lot of the lengths the lengths are you know greater than two, that's okay, but some of the widths are like not are the minimum width, and that means there's only one contact per source and drain, and uh, that could be why it's not reliable. Also, when the channel length switches, uh, when the channel length shrinks, right, the threshold voltage goes down in kind of an, uh, you know, an unreliable way. But these same things happens when the widths get small as well. So to have something that kind of gives you the same transistor characteristics, you probably want to keep the width of like above five, right? There's ways to figure that out and that'll be part of the project finding out the lengths and the widths that provide reliable um, you know transistor characteristics all right now another problem is that um, I said the VDD was too big but um, these we probably want something for the biasing right let's go find a I think these are 
um, you know, built into these op these uh, amplifiers, right, are a differential pair, and you need current mirrors and, and things like that to set the bias. But those current mirrors, especially the ones that we did in 124, depend on the voltage supply. Well, there's a circuit that um, called a beta multiplier, right, that I won't go into it now, but basically VDD can change quite a bit and this reference voltage will stay fixed. All right. So let me just run that. So I'm changing, this is VD, um, VDD and notice when VDD gets, you know, about a volt, right? This bias voltage remains relatively constant, right? So that's like a part that wasn't there that we would need to add and design, right? Um, another issue is that the analog multiplier, um, you're just using the square law of the MOSFETs to try to make sure that it, that it works. But it's really simplified, and I'm not quite sure if this is the best way to go. So we could study other simple uh, multiplier structures, right? Also, this needs the input and the inverted input. Well, maybe instead of single-ended, um, single output op amps, we should go to fully differential, right? So, yeah, one thing, maybe go to, we come up with fully differential amplifiers, right? Not the single-ended ones. So that's another thing uh, that could make it better, right? Um, now, as far as, you know, there's, there's a lot of circuitry here. And one might say, why are you using all these transistors, right, to make one quadratic integrate and fire when there's certainly other ways to do it? Um, here's a paper. Anyway, they only use one, two, three, four, five, six transistors to get a kind of a spiking behavior. The problem with this is the threshold voltages are going to bounce around a lot because that's, you know, when in a manufacturing environment, that's what happens. And there's really no biasing here. Right, you just have a plus or minus rail, and um, without any feedback or sensitivity, you kind of have to tune each one of these to to get it to work. All right. Um, actually, maybe go to my 122 notes. Let's see, two something gain. Yeah. So the thing is, is this is a MOSFET, and right, this is just, is that this has, if VT varies, right, the current, you know, the threshold voltage just um, manufacturing things, tolerances, right? It also varies based on length and width and temperature and, uh, and other things. But if that threshold voltage changes, then GM changes, the bias point changes, and the gain can wildly move around. Well, if I add a source to generation resistor, right, let's say for some reason this voltage is increased, then more current will flow, which will mean more voltage drop across here, which will mean VGS 
is reduced more towards the threshold voltage. And so it kind of gets rid of the effect of the threshold voltage having this thing here. Well, current mirrors, right, have effectively infinite resistance. And so you're, and current mirrors are part of differential pairs. And so those are, you know, biased circuits. They should be, give us a more reliable performance. And let me just, and why is that important? I'm just going to try to find some images for a neural net. Okay. Um, here's one. All right. So imagine these circles are all quadratic integrating fires. But see how all these inputs come in here? Well, they'd be summed and how much they're summed it would be weighted so one would be multiplied by one maybe this is 0.5 maybe this is 0.7 but if these individual neurons chip to chip are all varying right you would have to train this neural net on every chip you made so if if these were all constant i could find the weights of all these connections right and then when i made the chip I could just load these in, right? Rather than have to train this every single time. Um, training, um, you know, I was talking about, about testing with a TI person and they calculate a test cost down to 0 0.03 cents per part because they're doing so much. Well, if I had to train each chip, that would certainly blow that testing budget. Now, you might ask, hey, these are analog circuits, they're fixed, we can't change them after the fact. Well, where this hall is heading ultimately is field programmable analog arrays, all right? And they're fully differential, right? And you can, um, you can change your time constants. So if you take a capacitor and change how the switching frequency, you can turn this into a resistor and the resistance varies upon the uh, switching frequency. So, right, this is an integrator. If this whole thing was a resistor, well, by changing the switching frequency, I can change the value of the resistor, thus I can change the integration constant of a non-inverting integrator, right? So that switching frequency would be stored in memory, um, and thus you could get all these weights um, saved. Also, um, how would you sum weights? Well, that's, you know, Anyway, um, you know, inverting and non-inverting summers, right? You just have the scale factors um, that you would add things up with. And how would you change those resistances after the chip was made? Again, it's the switch capacitor business. So if this was now a summer, that's a resistor, right? And I have all these inputs. They're just being controlled by a switching frequency. This company does this, right? But where would we be ultimately doing is rather than these generic, there's about four op amps per per division here, right? Um, we would have it specialized to quadratic integrate and fire. The other thing that they do is if you look up, um, they do multiplication with a lookup table, which probably would take more power than our kind of all analog lookup table. And the other thing is, is, is it, is it really a multiplier we need? Um, right. Yeah. The quadratic integrate and fire uses X squared, right? But, the first thing we kind of need is 
the absolute value of x, right? So that's nonlinear, but it still won't make a spiking neuron. The fact that this is squared makes it um, this kind of go going past a switching threshold, not threshold voltage, kind of a point of no return on a quadratic integrating fire where it has to where it has to spike, right? But another you know, what's another non-linearity, non right? If I take the absolute value of um, right? If I take the absolute value of e to the x, right? That still gives me a non-linearity. It's just this one's a little nicer. So I don't really necessarily need x times x, right? I really need x squared. Well, you know, MOSFETs, right? Um, ID equals some scale factor, you know, n MOS or p MOS divided by 2 um, times, if we're in saturation, um, VGS minus VTN. Raised to the squared. Well, this is where our squared function is coming in. Then you kind of have to subtract this bit out. But really, MOSFETs, if you provide them the absolute value function, can do this. Right? And that's kind of what that multiplier structure is doing if uh, we look at it. So we have the inverted and non-inverting inputs. Uh, there's NA, there's A, kind of. And what happens is by having it differential, the current only flows one way. That gives us the absolute value. But then these transistor biases gives us the squared function. All right. There's a little more to it because it, you, it's squared plus or minus a value, and then you have to take care of that. But another research area, not for this project, is um, material systems that give you smaller values uh, for where that nonlinearity um, kicks in. Because if you use a diode, right, it, it's it can kind of take 0.4 volts before it really starts to be uh, that nonlinear. Anyway. Um, So yeah, this is in fact, um, you know, a very simple circuit for for neurons. If you want, and if you need another simulation, right? Um, where there's these various, you can see these various spikes. The thing is, is it's great, but actually calculating and doing anything with it is kind of difficult. Now, um, I want it. Where's that paper? So this is now. The thing is, is yeah. Well, I might disagree with this. It doesn't mean it's bad. It's just I think in order to have an engineering solution, things need to be uh, kind of reliable. And when you talk to biologists or even um, Anybody who deals with neurons, the neurons do vary quite a bit, and they need training, right? It's called university, right? Um, people need, you know, a whole university or a PhD before you can even be a professor. So um, the neurons are great in our brains, and they're low power, and they're all that. But, yeah, it takes us years to learn things. Um, but what I like about this paper is...
one thing is they have this great table of a literature review and they have leaky integrating fire not one of these is um, a, a true spiking neural network these don't have these non-linearities but they give you the technology the area and then the power so in fact um, this figure is kind of like a really good literature review right off uh, the top of their head this picture yeah I guess it's a PDF I think they could have done better they have bursting right which should be a spiking neural net but um, and here's the thing so here's all their neurons right but they're not connected to anything and they're not doing anything each one is their own neuron and so you would just test one 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 right they're not interconnected um, and yeah I mean they did it at a uh, 0.65 micron um, they tell you all this stuff right you can see these nice tables so I think it's a well-written paper and it's um, and yeah look right here they've got a uh, the chips are down for Moore's law these are all reasons why we want to do uh, analog neuromorphic electronic systems so compact no yeah I guess the one thing is uh, they don't cite my stuff so but that's okay um, but these first four hmm, I might have been at that conference anyway these first four references are great okay and this paper is um, it's in here right you can download it from there um, I guess while I'm here, might as well just go through this. Um, now, what what I would you know a picture of some kind of spiking thing uh, would be nice. Now, maybe you should send each other each other's presentations so you don't use exactly the same picture. But um, now the team that's important, but what is each person going to do right um, he's gonna do the multiplier he's gonna do the uh, the op amp part he's gonna do the testing right I'm making that up but specifically who's in charge of what right now yeah what are we doing yeah we're this is basic fundamental research but like I said we're gonna create design fabricate and test um, a quadratic integrating fire and a library of analog parts that can be used for other projects right this um, I think the why we've done before um, but we're trying to get lower power than digital or even for driving cars though right now it takes a lot of power to do autonomous driving this should be able to do it better also I know this is just one sentence in a very long presentation on my part um, I think neurons are great at getting being able to process signals in a noisy environment and that could be where they really shine target client um, this or you know we, we will ultimately become a control systems company where we use these chips to help people um, previous work yeah the stuff from you know this is where the literature review is but yeah we've got two mass we got a master's thesis we've got some XOR stuff you know anything in there that I put on uh, you know you can use um, Area S implications might be better for social justice. Okay. Um, yep, you got to do that. This is the, again, I, I guess Professor Shu said, where's the circuit diagram? Well, I gave you some to start with. This is the, a different neuron, so I wouldn't use it. Um, again, yeah, major components, op amp, multiplier, hysteretic reset. It's all in that spice file, LT spice file. Flow chart, 
Yeah, what are the big things? Well, you know, the schematic capture of the design, the actual layout of the design, sending out the design for fabrication, and testing it. You can have these Gantt charts with like a million things are hard to see. But if there's like those four things, do the schematic, do the layout, send it out for design and test it. Right. And then uh, document with when those should occur. Everybody can read it. Right. This is a normal presentation. Now, yeah, in the written, you would probably want more detail. Uh, yeah, I guess this is where the skill set would go and resources. So the team, yeah, the team, yeah, here's the team right here. So you don't really need that slide. Um, yeah, costs. The, the cost is your, is really the opportunity cost of your labor because everything is really going to be free. The department provides the cadence software. Moses provides these designs for free. Um, it, but it's it's not really for free. So what you do is just estimate your work hours and multiply it by $150 an hour. That will cover everything. Now, yeah, and you can put in, you can roughly estimate at 20 hours per semester, per week, for 16 weeks of the semester per person. That'll, that'll give you your uh, thing. Um, yeah, just wrap it up. And again, uh, I think I had some better references. Um, thanks for sending this to me. I know, uh, you know, you probably thought it was a little bit rough, but at least now you have the feedback. All right, good luck.